in the first service, uh, we, we saw quite a number of people come forward for prayer for healing. And it was just wonderful to see God moving in some people's lives and doing some things that will look forward to getting more testimonies next week. But there was one lady that came in with a walking stick and she had severe hip issues, um, really you know, quite bad for some period of time. And Nigel started the service off by quoting that scripture, my lips will praise you. And uh, as Nigel said it, I just saw that woman in my mind and I just felt the scripture, my hips will praise you. Um, was appropriate for her. So when she came forward for prayer, we prayed for her, and she went out without using the stick. And she was able to run back and forth the front here, just with a sense of the Lord touching her, and uh, look forward to her sharing that next week. But I believe that the gospel that of Jesus Christ is a life-transforming message that goes right to the very heart of the issue and transforms everything around us, that we're not waiting for something to happen. Jesus has already made everything that needs to happen to happen in order for us to know his goodness and his life. And I, I want to just declare it straight up this morning uh, in this room and people watching online, other people tuned in today as well with illness that I believe that the Lord is going to touch lives here this morning. And as we come to his word, it's going to stir faith within our hearts because the Bible says a faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and signs and wonders follow the preaching of God's word. And I believe this morning we're going to see the hand of the Lord touching people's lives in a powerful way. So are you ready for that? Yeah. Is there anyone come this morning in need of healing? Anyone need healing? Just, just raise your hand a moment, would you? We're not going to call you out yet. But Father, we pray this morning as we look at your word that... Faith will stir in hearts, and I pray that we will know that whatever the need, that you are greater than the need. You are more powerful than the circumstance, and that you will bring freedom and life and healing into every situation and everybody. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd like you to turn with me in the scriptures, if you have a Bible with you, to Colossians 1.15. If you've not got a Bible, these verses will appear on the screen but if you have, then please turn to it and follow along with me. This morning, I'm not going to speak a word that's going to be about you. Uh, it's not going to talk about what you should do or how you should live or the difference it should make in your life. I'm not going to talk about you this morning. I'm not going to talk about your application of this. I'm not going to talk about us. I'm not going to talk about the church and what we're going to do and the vision that we have. This morning, I'm just going to talk about Jesus and what Jesus is and what Jesus does. And I want you to hear this. This is profound, life-changing, life-transforming truth. This is the Savior of our souls, Jesus. And it says this in Colossians 1.15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. At the beginning of verse 20 there, it says, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. The reconciliation of all things has been made possible through Jesus. Now, I looked at the word reconcile in the dictionary, and it had a number of offerings for me. Here are some of them. It means to restore friendly relations or to settle a quarrel, to reunite, to bring back together, to restore harmony, to make peace, to resolve differences, to make or show to be compatible, to harmonize, to synthesize, to make congruent. Those are some of the things that reconcile do. And Jesus has come that through him all things may be reconciled, things in heaven and on earth. And it says, 
by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. By his blood. His blood was given to reconcile all things. His blood was the greatest peace offering that the world has ever experienced or known. He's not a peace make, he's not a peacekeeper, he is a peacemaker. See, peacekeepers, they try and just keep things under wraps and try and keep the arguments away from each other. But peacemakers turn tables over. Peacemakers unsettle the status quo. Peacemakers knock heads together to get issues resolved. Peacemakers are intolerant of the things that stand between the restoration and the reconciliation. And Jesus came to this earth to be a peacemaker and to give his blood to make peace in restoring and reconciling all things. That blood we know was shed upon the cross. And in that blood, there is great power, which we're going to look at in a moment. But the church, you and I, have been invited into a mission And that is the mission of joining Jesus in the reconciliation of all things. You see, once I was an enemy to God, and Jesus' blood shed on the cross for me, reconciled me, reconciled my relational dissidence, my relational distance, reconciled me to a place of unity and harmony. And so I'm synchronized with the purposes of God, and I'm no longer an enemy of God, but I am now a friend of God. And God has called each of us to be on a mission to bring reconciliation into the world. To bring, as Jesus put in the Lord's Prayer, that model of prayer he gave us, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Let there be reconciliation of heaven's purposes on the face of the earth today. And I believe that you and I are called to see with the eyes of faith the reconciling move of God that Jesus is walking around this city. Jesus is walking in some of the darkest places, some of the most difficult circumstances, some of the most hopeless environments. And he is walking around with a heart that says, my blood was shed to reconcile you. No longer to live in hopelessness, but to live in hope. No longer to live in despair, but to live in joy. No longer to live distant, but to live close, that the Spirit of the Lord is moving around this city and this region and this nation, and I believe with all of my heart that God's plan for this nation is the reconciliation of all things, of all people, of all 70 million people in this UK nation to be reconciled to an understanding that God is a peacemaker and that God has done everything that is needed in order for that to be fulfilled. I believe that's the purpose of the church, is to join in that mission of God in reconciling. We're not called to be the reconciliators. That's done because Jesus has given his blood to make that possible, but we're called to partner with Jesus in that mission. And Jesus is a worthy reconciler. If we go to Revelation chapter 5, we read that John, who was having a vision while he was on an island, and this vision, in this vision, he sees a scroll with seven seals upon this scroll. And in heaven, everyone is saying, who can open this scroll? And there's no one that's worthy to open this scroll. And we pick up just at the moment that it's announced that there is one who is worthy to open this scroll. Revelation 5, verses 4 onwards, it says this, I wept, and I wept, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb 
looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb, each one at a harp. And they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God, persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, in a loud voice they were saying, and why do we join in with them together? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. That was good, but it does say in a loud voice they were saying. So let's try this again. It sounded a bit like a school assembly that then. So come on. I know the youth are away right now and they might be returning any moment, but let's join in together and in a loud voice, let's join with the angelic hosts. This is thousands upon thousands 10,000 times 10,000 angels, all declaring this, not with a whisper, but with a loud declaration. Let's join with them. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The Lamb of God. You may be waiting for a move of the Holy Spirit to sweep through the nation, to sweep through your life, to sweep through your home. And I want you to know that Jesus has made everything possible for you to live in freedom and life and power today. Amen. And I just sense this word over our lives as a church. We're not waiting for something. We need to rise up into what we've got. Yeah. We need to rise up in who and understand, have an understanding of who the Lord is. Who is power is able to overcome in the nations and the, the universes incredible, unprecedented, life-giving, reconciling power. I love that he's the reconciler of all. Romans 10, 13 says that whoever or everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love there's no disclaimer there. There's no asterisk with some small detail. Every toe rag, every misfit, Every ragamuffin, everyone who's messed up, everyone who feels unworthy, everyone who feels they could never come close to God, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. And there are some people you're saying no for. There are some people that you think are too far away from the power and the presence of God that surely he can't save them. I want you to know that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just reading this week the story of Saul, who was breathing, it says, murderous, murderous threats against the church in the book of Acts. 
And there he is on the road to Damascus, carrying out his evil intent and business against the people of God. And suddenly Jesus appears to him on the road. And Jesus speaks to him and confronts him. And we read that Saul had an encounter with the living God. And we read that Saul, who later changed his name to Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, surely there is no one that the Lord cannot reach. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who are you saying no for? I love that Romans 10, 9 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is your mouth that you profess that you are saved. It's an important confession here, isn't it, of our mouth. We, we read it's important to, to confess, to declare, to speak out. And our mouths are, are powerful. You know, James talks about our mouths being like a little rudder on a ship that's able to change the whole course of the ship, or a little flame that ignites in a forest and is able to start a wildfire. Our mouths are really powerful. Our tongues are powerful places of confession. And it's not that it's declaring here that faith is not a private thing. It's to be confessed, it's to be declared. Jesus has saved me. Does anyone in the house this morning know the saving power of God? Anyone know that his blood has been shed to eliminate all the shame and the fear and all the pain of your past? Whom the Son sets free, sets free completely. We're not waiting for some move of the Holy Spirit to come and let you know that you have been saved. You can declare it and confess it now because the power of the resurrection, Jesus, is greater than your sin. It's greater than your rebellion. It's greater than your fears. And he breaks the power of canceled sin. Let me just read to you what the blood of Jesus, some of the things the blood of Jesus has accomplished. 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You are cleansed by the power of the blood of Jesus. You are victorious. Whether you feel victorious, whether right now the circumstances of your life are clouding around you, and you feel surrounded on every side, the blood of Jesus makes you fundamentally a victorious person. It says, Revelation 12, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Again, that confession. And they loved not their lives unto the death. You've been freed from the curse of the law. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. And we've been brought into a covenant of promise and brought close to him. Ephesians 2 says that at that, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We've been brought near to him, not by our merits, not by our attendance at church, not by how much we read God's word. We've been brought near to him by the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's why you are free and you're cleansed. And Jesus' power of reconciliation are supreme and unrivaled. All things he has come to reconcile. All people, all things. As that prayer we mentioned just a few moments ago, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's about a whole range of things in our society. Justice, 
Justice is not just about you getting what you deserve, but there are great injustices within our society. And we are not called to fight with the weapons of this world. We have uh, weapons of our warfare are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, but we manifest those things by moving in the opposite spirit to those things. Yeah. If you see an injustice, you, don't have, you certainly don't fight an injustice with injustice. You fight it with the truth yeah. of God's word and his power and his love, and you stand strong, and you put a buckle of truth on, and you stand strong. I love some of the crazy freedom fighters there are in the world fighting against the causes of injustice in our society, fueled by a desire of being a part of the mission of God to reconcile all things to God. There's a reconciliation of compassion, real compassion that's stirred and provoked by the heart of God. Families will know the reconciliation of God. People in society who are desperately lonely. It's an epidemic of loneliness which many people are referring to. Many people's struggles, even some addictions, are as a result of feeling isolated and not knowing that sense of belonging in community and in society. The gospel, Jesus, comes to bring belonging we live in a day where there are probably more believers on the face of the earth than there ever has been at any other time in history. Across the globe, the Spirit of God is doing incredible things. And just because the church feels like it's marginalized in this nation, I wouldn't want you to mistake that with an understanding that Jesus is not at work. Jesus is working across the face of the earth through his people and by his spirit, to reconcile all things to himself. I believe there's a powerful moment coming in this nation. And I believe that we're called to just not to speak about the ills and speak about the things we're disappointed at and to speak against the politicians and to speak against the things we don't like, but we're called to speak prophetically and to see that Jesus stands alongside us to speak his hope and life into our society. You see, we don't, we don't turn the tables of injustice over by just moaning about them. Just going to do a little, you know, Twitter campaign to address that injustice. I'm going to sign a, a petition. No, 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 no. Jesus is far more radical than that. His gospel is far more engaged than that. It's not just lobbing stones from another side of a, of a bridge. It's about getting involved, rolling our sleeves up, and prophetically taking the hope of the gospel and arriving in the deepest, darkest circumstance and saying, I've got good news for you. The good news is this. Jesus is here to reconcile all things. Jesus is here to bring hope. Jesus is here to bring transformation and life. And we don't do that in our own right. Because Jesus is already there. We're just announcing what Jesus is doing. We're announcing his, his presence. That's what the church is designed to do. is to announce the presence of God. To announce that he's here. Jesus came announcing the good news of the kingdom. The church is here to announce, not to complain, to moan. He calls us to see his presence engaged and active by faith. I see with the eyes of faith. While I was away, I read a biography, autobiography, by Reinhard Bonnke. Uh, if you've not read it and you enjoy biographies, then it's as good a read as you can get. It's a terrific book talking about his journey over many years of incredible evangelistic endeavor of seeing millions of people come to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's a stirring, passionate book. He tells a story in the book just after a few years of his arrival in South Africa as a young German missionary. He was pretty, pretty disappointed with the, with the state of the church in South Africa. Um, apartheid was had a strong grip on that nation, and the blacks and the whites had different churches, and there were things that he just couldn't 
reconcile of what had become normal in the church at that time. But he was invited to speak to one of these churches, so he arrived there on a Friday. And as he arrived at this church, he was struck by something that he observed from the congregation. As he looked across the congregation, he noticed something. He noticed that nearly all the hair was gray. He said to the pastor at the end of the service, he said, where are all the young people? There are no young people. Why are there no young people? The pastor said, let me take you to where the young people are. So at the end of the service, Reinhard got in the pastor's car and they drove some distance away. And they arrived at this big car park where there were loads of vehicles. And they could hear music pumping from somewhere in the vicinity. They opened the car doors and they could feel the ground shake with the bass drum of this music. It was so loud. And the pastor said, this is where all the young people are. This was the, towards the end of the 60s. And the pastor said, you see, Reinhard, there's a craze sweeping the world called the discotheque. <laughs> and young people, they're across the globe. They're going in droves to these discotheques. And they're going into these rooms and they've got this awful loud music and they're spending the night dancing in the discos and that's why they're not in the churches and Reinhardt said oh no 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 um how do we compete with this how can we as a church you know we just come from this service with a bunch of old people and he was playing his piano accordion and singing some songs and he thought how can we compete with this and they were about to get back in the car but Reinhardt sensed Jesus, speak to him. And he said, I can't leave. I need to go in the disco. But I've got a problem. What if the people who've just seen me preach see me go into the disco? What sort of reputation is that going to have for a German missionary in South Africa? But he said, Jesus is saying, I need to go in. So he and the pastor, wearing their suits, having come straight from a church service, open the doors to the discotheque. And they walk in and the noise, the volume is even greater now they're inside. And this volume just sweeps their hair back. And they're seeing all these young people with just such close proximity. And they're thinking, oh, I want to leave this place. But Jesus said, I want you to find the owner. So they walked through trying to ask around above the noise, who was the owner of this disco? And they found a man sat in a corner. And Reinhard went across with his suit. And he said, I'm a preacher. I understand you're the owner of the disco. And the owner said, yes, that's right. He said, I want to preach at your disco. And the man looked at him up and down in his suit. And he said, you're right, you are a preacher. And preachers preach in churches. And we run discos in discos. You go do what you do elsewhere, and we'll do what we do here. And Reinhardt said, no, no, no. He said, because you see, on the way in, Reinhardt had looked at the faces of the hundreds of young people. And from all the noise and the dancing, his first assumptions of the joy that they were experiencing were replaced with images of insecurity and fear and disappointment and emptiness. And he said, I need to preach. Just give me five minutes to preach. And the man said, there's no way you are preaching in this disco. He said, just five minutes, please. I plead with you, five minutes. He said, no way. And then Reinhard, sensing that Jesus was wanting to muscle his way into this situation, he felt the prompting to ask this question of the owner. He said, can I ask you one question? He said, do you think that what you're offering these young people answers their need for the rest of their lives? And the man sat back in his chair. He said, you know, I've got some older kids. And when I see my kids, I sometimes wonder what they will become in the future. And I see what I'm doing here, and I think this isn't offering them proper hope. 
He said, listen, I'll give you five minutes, but not tonight, tomorrow night. So Rhino was so excited, he left, got into the car, and then suddenly thought, why did I only ask for five minutes? Hey, I should have asked for more. Anyway, the next night he was preaching at the same church. This time he took a change of clothes, and after the service, he got into his jeans and shirt, and he went to the disco. He was given five minutes on a Saturday night at midnight. And they arrive in the car park. There's even more cars there this time. And they get out of the car and they make their way towards these loud sounds coming out of the disco. They open the door. It was busier than the previous night. And he looks at his watch, just a few minutes till midnight. And he runs to the front and he picks up the microphone. And he says, everybody sit down. Sit down. He was Scottish. <laughs> sit down. And there's no chairs, there's no seats, but some were confused and began to sit down. Others just, just stood against the edges of the bar. And he, um, he said, I'm, I've come all the way from Germany to tell you something. I've come all the way from Germany to announce something really important to you. And he began to give the gospel of Jesus. How Jesus gave his life on the cross, his blood shed for them so that they can be free and they can know reconciliation in their lives to their creator. And he said in his five minutes, if you want to give your life to Jesus, then you respond now by standing or raising your hands. Within moments, every person he could see in this place responded to the gospel. There were tears across this disco as people discovered the love of God. See, right now, in that story, he discovered that Jesus was already there wanting to do something. And Jesus was looking for a partner to assist him in the mission of recon reconciling all things. A year later, Reinhard went back to that area and the pastor picked him up from the airport and said, oh, I'm so excited you're back. I must take you somewhere. So he drives him to where the disco is. The car park is full once again and they get out of the car, but he can't hear the heavy beats that he was used to a year ago. But he can hear some noise and they walk towards the disco, but the sign that says disco has now been taken away, and there's a cross outside, and they open the doors, and there are hundreds of young people worshiping Jesus and loving God. That disco closed down within weeks of that initial story a year previously. It had closed down and gone bankrupt. A church had heard about what was happening, and they'd sponsored a pastor to go in and to lead that young congregation, and a thriving church grew there all because someone was able to see with the eyes of faith that the king of all glory, the worthy lamb of God, the one whose blood brings about transformation to the very, very detail of our lives, that he was present and desirous to work. I wonder what circumstances you and I will go into this week where Jesus is present and he's just looking for some people with eyes of faith to see, to speak out, to be bold, to be courageous. I believe you and I are called to that mission. See, I believe that there's a, a move of salvation across this nation. It's been wonderful to hear all the stories of Christian festivals this summer already talking about the power of God at work and the faith rising up in the people of God and the spiritual temperature rising in our nation. Jesus is at work. Yeah. And his people are called to declare that Jesus has come to reconcile all things, to be a prophetic people. We're going to pray for people now. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's not just listening that's really allowing the word of God to permeate in us and for us to welcome his word into our lives. To create a welcome mat, to open the door, to take the chain of our insecurities off and just to open wide and say, God, Jesus, I want you to come and do what only you can do. Your blood has been shed to make a way 
where there was no way to reconcile me. And I believe this morning there's going to be all sorts of reconciliation of things in people's lives. I believe this morning there's going to be more healings take place. I believe this morning there's going to be more restoration of relationships take place. There's going to be a number of things that the Lord's about to do in our lives as we welcome him. Doesn't matter how dark it is. Doesn't matter how difficult it's been. Doesn't matter how hopeless it seems. His blood has the power to break every chain in our lives. It's a strange verse in Matthew 13, 58. It's reflected in one of the other Gospels as well. In the other Gospel, it says there was some, that Jesus couldn't do any miracles there in his town because of the lack of faith. Matthew softens it a little bit and says he just did not do many miracles there because of the lack of faith. See, faith is like a welcome mat. Not that we sort of close our eyes and try and conjure something up. That's not, that's not faith. That's mind over matter. But faith is, is putting the mat out and saying, God, I welcome you to come and do what you want to do. I believe you can and have made it possible. So if you're in need of healing this morning, can I ask you just to raise your hands where you are once again? Would you stand if you're able to, if you're physically able to? As you stand, I'd like you to begin to just express your heart to God. God, I want to open the door of my life to welcome you, to have your way in me. Would you just do that? Would you let that be the prayer of your own heart now? I welcome your word. I welcome your truth. And as his word has been brought to us this morning, that there will be signs and wonders that confirm the preaching of his word. Okay, where, wherever you're stood now, if you're able to, would you just come to the front? I'm going to ask the area pastors, ministry team, any life group leaders to come forward as well. And we're going to lay hands on these precious people. I don't know what the story of your illness is. I don't know what the background has been. I don't know if it's been in your family line for years. I don't know if it's something that's come from an injury. I don't know the story. But I do know this, that I, I don't believe God made this world to be designed with the illness. It's come as a result of a fall in society, a fall of mankind. And I believe that part of the power of God present today is that there are bodies he wants to touch and heal. There are lives he wants to set free. So just relax into it now. We're not trying to make something happen. Just lift your hands to heaven. Just relax. It's the presence of God. His power. You can't make this happen. Jesus, just come and place your hand upon these precious people now. Come place your hand upon them. With your compassion and your power, and your healing flow, you know every need, you know the circumstances of every life. Church, would you reach out your hands towards those that are at the front? And would you speak healing over their lives? Would you begin to pray for them? Begin to reach out to them and speak the word of God over them? As others come and lay hands upon them. In Jesus' name. Yes, oh God. Let healing power flow, oh God. Healing power flow, oh God. It's a beautiful peace just coming over some lives right now. Just a peace coming in your minds. It's good. Such mercy. For some of you, the, the pain of your bodies, the, 
the illness has robbed you of peace. And I understand that. I get that. The Lord wants to restore peace to you as well as healing your bodies. Father, let your peace come and flood every mind now, every heart, every life. Your peace flow, O oh God. And we rebuke the strategies of the enemy over bodies, and lives, and circumstances. The blood of Jesus breaks every chain. Every chain. Every chain's broken. Every chain is broken. 